And so on this Christmas Eve, having heard the story from the Gospels, we turn now to the words that prepared the way for tonight, the words of the prophet Isaiah. A reading from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2, 6, and 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, and authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's face it, the past months have not been easy. Long ago, the prophet Isaiah spoke the words about a people who walked in darkness. Those words actually seem like an appropriate metaphor for us today. When you walk in darkness, you're not sure where you're going. You stumble, you lose track of time. You wish it would just be over and that there would be some light finally breaking through on the horizon. Now, during this pandemic time, we've tried to make the best of things. We've stayed home as much as possible. We've learned a lot about restaurants that deliver and curbside grocery services. We've stocked up on paper goods. We've bought personalized masks. We've even found humor in holiday gag gifts like COVID-themed Christmas ornaments or Dr. Fauci bobblehead dolls. But still, it's been a dark season with little to amuse us. Think about when's the last time that you hugged a friend, when you wandered aimlessly shopping in your favorite store, when you sat in a movie theater or a crowded concert hall. We now have had Zoom calls instead of family reunions. We've gathered around screens instead of being together for weddings and funerals or even for church. Anxiety and depression are up, jobs and savings and income are down. Schools have been disrupted, work has been disrupted, life has been disrupted, as if someone flicked off the lights nine months ago and then simply walked away from the switch. We are a people who have walked in darkness which is why it's worth pointing out that much of the Christmas story actually takes place in the dark. I say that not to suggest that darkness is okay and nothing to worry about, but rather to note that disruptions and darknesses inevitably happen in this life. And sometimes, in those very moments, we see most clearly the plans and the power of a loving God. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus declaring that all the world must be registered. To be registered meant to be enrolled, literally counted, and put on the Roman tax rolls so that your wealth might be taken to pay for the oppressive Roman government. It was not optional, nor was it voluntary. And so to honor this decree, it meant that Joseph, and his very pregnant young wife had to travel from their home in Nazareth to a place that only had historical meaning for them, the city of Bethlehem far to the south, the ancestral home of Joseph's family. We don't know if Joseph and Mary had ever even visited the city before, but we do know that on that day, Bethlehem was overfull with folks who had gathered because of the census. And the best that Joseph and Mary could do was to find a stable to bed down for the night while the evening fell. Darkness and disruption. 
In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Cows and horses graze without eating the grass down to its roots because they draw in the vegetation with their tongues and then bite it off with their lower teeth. But sheep have a cleft upper lip, which allows them to nibble the grass down to its roots, even below the level of the soil. And so although sheep may eat less than cattle, they constantly require fresh pastures. What that means then for shepherds is that they're almost never at home, wandering about for new fields. Shepherds were the original social distancers, which suited most people just fine because they were definitely not part of society's elite. Shepherds watching their flocks by night. Darkness, distancing, and once the angels arrived, disruption. In the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is this child who is born King of the Jews? We observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. Foreign emissaries would often travel into neighboring countries to bring gifts and tributes when there was the birth of a new king. In this case, these visitors, these magi, were also astrologers, reading signs in heaven for news about earth. But the message that they shared filled the land with turmoil. It frightened King Herod to his very core, so much so that he would lie to the magi to find out more about this infant king and soon thereafter, he would institute a pogrom to kill literally scores of male babies in the land of Judea. And when did these magi travel? Well, they traveled at night, in the darkness, following a star. Darkness, death, disruption. So Mary and Joseph, the shepherds, the Magi, like us, they walked in darkness, but they were not destined to be defined by darkness, and neither are we. In the words of the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Darkness is something we push back against. We let our pupils widen so that we can accustom our eyes to the darkness and make out the shapes in front of us amid the shadows and somehow find a way forward even when it's difficult. And thankfully during this year, we have not let the darkness of the past months defeat us. If you can hear my voice this Christmas Eve, you have not withdrawn into the shadows. You've chosen to stay connected, to be part of the body of Christ, worshiping and praying across the miles. You, hopefully over the past weeks, have seen the nobility of spirit that resides in those around us, those who have served the common good in often thankless jobs, stocking our shelves, cleaning the floors in our hospitals, serving meals in restaurants or delivering it to homes, teaching in schools or online, parenting full-time and working full-time, often from the very same kitchen table. During this time of isolation, we have pushed back against the darkness. After the death of George Floyd, we broke the silence to cry out that Black Lives Matter and to flood the streets in protest. Despite our political cynicism, we voted in numbers in November not seen for over 120 years. Despite, despite prejudices that would despise the stranger and the migrant, this global pandemic has shown us that borders are simply human chalk lines pretending to be walls. Because if one person, one child anywhere is at risk, then all our lives are touched. And that's why we do not go quietly into that good night. By God's grace, we know that this world holds much more than just darkness and disruption. 
Another poem by Dylan Thomas is titled, Light Breaks Where No Sun Shines. And I love that image. Too often we imagine the Christmas light as something that breaks in like a dramatic beam from heaven, a celestial spotlight blinding us in all its glory. But think about the real Christmas story. Mary and Joseph's eyes had to adjust to the darkness of the back streets of Bethlehem as they searched out a stable that would ultimately hold the Christ child. And once the angels left them, the shepherds had to navigate their path through the dark evening night as they went through those fields to find this nativity scene in a back street of the neighboring village. And the magi, they did all of their work at night, trusting solely in the distant beams of a wandering star that everyone else scarcely noticed. Light breaks where no sun shines, even the Christmas light, because God is at work within you, behind you and beside you in the darkness, especially in the tough times. And that's why Isaiah would say, the people who walked in darkness, upon them a light has broken in. It has dawned somewhere behind our eyes, somewhere within our hearts, somewhere deep in our souls, and this light gently illuminates the outline of a sleeping Christ child. Imagine that. The prophet Isaiah describes then this light, this Christ child, by using a string of nouns and a couple adjectives. For in Christ we see suddenly the embodiment of wonderful, of joy incarnate. We see in Christ the counselor, the wisdom of the ages. We see mighty God, creation and power coming together. We see everlasting parent, the timeless and self-giving love. And we see one who is the giver of peace, whose authority, whose light will grow continually, and it will grow through justice and through righteousness. And it shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Too often, exuberant preachers try to convince you that Christmas is about spotlights of glory, blinding us like deer caught in God's high beams. Too often, revival pulpiteers will insist that Christ's light is holy and unique, while our difficult lives are unholy and dark and unworthy. Yet all that evangelical shouting for us to step into the light can give no comfort when we must walk in darkness. And that's why the real message of Christmas is that God came into our darkness, into our COVID-anxious, weary, and worried world, coming to us as a child, born in a humble stable, precisely designed to allow our night vision eyes to make out the nativity scene. And as we focus on that scene, a soft, gentle light reflects back to us, and we understand. And like the prophet Isaiah, we too say, Behold, the one before us is wonderful, is wisdom, is creation, is timeless love, is peace beyond all understanding. So know that you have company in this dark season. Look around you. There are shepherds and magi, Mary and Joseph, and a child who is born to us, a babe who is given to us, the light of the world. And we are never alone and in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, the darkness will pass away. Thanks be to God. Amen.